Welcome back to Cultural Anthropology. Um, this week we're covering Chapter 6, Foodways, in Welsh and Vivanco. And I wanted to give you guys a quick overview of one of the big sections, which is how do different societies get food? Um, the main idea in this section is something called um, patterns of subsistence or subsistence strategies. So I wanted to go over those really quickly uh, and uh, you can sort of dive deeper into the book, but this is a quick overview for you. So the first thing I want to mention is that this whole idea of subsistence strategies comes to us from a branch of anthropology called cultural ecology. Cultural ecology is to culture what um, ecology is to biological organisms, right? Ecology studies the relationship of an organism to the other elements within its environment, whereas cultural ecology studies the relationship of a society to other elements in its environment through the use of culture. In other words, the ways that people use culture to adapt to their environment. So what are subsistence strategies? Simply put, these are strategies for obtaining the material resources necessary for a people's way of life. Um, now, most people don't use just one uh, subsistence strategy, but they tend to lean more heavily on one than the others. Um, usually groups use a mix of these strategies based on the kind of resource that they're um, using how necessary that resource is, is for survival, and finally, how their economic or social system is structured. Now, there are three main types, and the third type is sort of subdivided into four other types. So the three main types are foraging, pastoralism, and agriculture. And within agriculture, we have occasional horticulture, slash and burn horticulture, also known as swiddening, intensive agriculture, and finally mechanized industrial agriculture, also known as agribusiness. So I'm gonna go into a little more detail about each of these in the coming slides here. Let's start with foraging. Foraging is the type of subsistence strategy that humans have used for the longest. Uh, until about 10,000 years ago, um, it was the only subsistence strategy that we used, okay? Uh, it involves um, an intense knowledge of the landscape and the environment you live in, uh, and involves going out into that landscape and um, exploiting resources that are oftentimes only available seasonally uh, or occasionally and understanding the patterns of nature such that you know where to go when those things are available. Um, it requires a great deal of land, uh, but it also has the lowest impact on that land. Uh, <clears throat> usually these are small scale cultures, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we're talking about sort of band-sized cultures. Um, bands are anywhere from sort of 50 to, sorry, around 30 to 50 people. And they um, typically are organized around kinship, that is family relationships. So these are usually closely related people who will meet up with other bands in the environment from time to time, but mostly sort of live out their lives um, uh, with one another. Uh, oftentimes labor is divided by gender and by age, and that's about the only kinds of division of labor that there are in these societies. Um, and as I said before, people in these societies tend to have a very complex knowledge of animals, plants, and the landscape. We'll also find that people in these kinds of societies who use foraging as their main way of, of, of getting what they need, um, people tend to all have 
the same kind of knowledge of the environment. Some people might be better at some things than others, but for the most part, everybody can do all the things that are needed to survive. Pastoralism. Pastoralism is the use of animals or for food, drink, and trade. Uh, it often involves keeping herds and then following those herds around or actually driving them from one grazing uh, place to another over the course of the seasons. Uh, division of labor is often heavily gendered. Uh, these people have a very intimate knowledge of their um, of their herds and of their herd animals as well as the land that they live on um, and the animals themselves become a very important part of the culture oftentimes becoming a kind of currency or at the very least a sort of status symbol um, in this these sorts of societies we tend to find uh, uh, men and women have more commercial skills because they engage in trade with other kinds of societies much more often. It is uh, largely based on barter, but also they are involved in the monetary system as well, um, and tend to have close contacts with intensive agricultural communities. So in other words, they're kind of specialized. They don't spend all their time in the field growing things, so they need to get that stuff from somebody else who does do that. Um, good examples of these societies are the Nur and the Maasai, both in Africa. Um, this is actually a picture of a Maasai herdsman slash warrior who's uh, watching his herds with both his sort of shepherd's crook there and a, and a spear. Because, you know, in Kenya, one of the problems is lions. They happen. Okay, the third type of um, subsistence pattern is agriculture, also better known as farming. But we divide this into sort of four very different kinds of agriculture. Okay, This first one is occasional horticulture. Uh, it's a minimal reliance on horticulture. Um, the horticulture tends to just supplement the foraging. We tend to find it only in band and kinship based organizations, like I was saying before, 30 to 50 closely related people. Um, generally, there is not a monetary system or a limited contact with the monetary system around them. Um, and simple trade and generalized reciprocity tend to be greater. Uh, one of the key features, there's a big debate actually about whether the degree to which occasional horticulture is a sort of natural outgrowth of foraging so that while you're in the forest, maybe you clear a small plot and plant some of the seeds of the thing you just ate and come back later uh, in the year and pick them up. So very little, very little sort of interaction with the, uh, with the plot. Um, other people think that actually a lot of reliance on occasional horticulture is actually a side effect of colonialism. So in other words, as colonial um, powers sort of created restrictions on land use, uh, this is particularly true in Southern Africa, in Namibia and Botswana, uh, uh, when European colon uh, colonial powers took over there. Uh, this was the experience of the of the Juhuansi, that they were driven further to further and further margins. Um, on the landscape. So the colonial powers took the better and better land and that left less and less for the same number of people to forage on, which made it more difficult to succeed in foraging. Uh, and so occasional horticulture became more and more important for these groups as a result. Uh, today, um, the Juhansi, as opposed to 60 or 70 years ago, uh, live 
kind of in between these two systems, depending on where you are in the uh, in the Kalahari. Slash and burn. This sounds awful. We've all been trained to think slash and burn is terrible. Slash and burn is awful. This is what's happening in the Amazon. It's the worst possible thing. I am not talking about the kind of slash and burning that goes on necessary on a large scale in the Amazon, which is being sort of perpetrated by large um, uh, uh, livestock um, concerns and uh, other agricultural concerns. This is a much smaller scale phenomenon. And on a small scale, this is extremely sustainable agriculture. Agriculture tends to take nutrients out of the land. You've got to replace those nutrients somehow. Now with um, intensive agriculture, we replace those nutrients with some kind of fertilizer, manure or chemical fertilizers of some kind. In swiddening, what they do instead is you clear a plot of, of land and burn off the sort of weeds, not a big enough fire to start a huge conflagration, but enough to clear things out. And then you plant in that on that plot of land for several years until it starts becoming less and less productive, at which point you move to another plot, clear it, burn it, and start farming it. And you'll do that over the course of several plots for, you know, a decade or more. And eventually you come back around to the first one because in the meantime, the forest has grown over, plants have fixed nitrogen back into the soil and made it productive again. And so it's actually a very sustainable way on a small scale of farming. Um, most societies that do this are growing crops mostly for their own subsistence. So they're not growing tons of crops to sell at the market. They're mostly growing them to eat, maybe share among neighbors, that sort of thing. Uh, occasionally there are surpluses and those surpluses are traded for goods, money to some extent. Uh, and for the most part, the agricultural technologies tend to be relatively simple, digging sticks, human powered technology. So if you've got a plow, it's people that are pulling it, right? Um, and probably a key example of this are the Hmong from uh, Southeast Asia, Cambodia, Laos, uh, and uh, Vietnam. That brings us to intensive agriculture. Uh, intensive agriculture is larger scale farming, includes specialized crops. So you grow just one crop on a field. Um, instead of growing in, uh, in Swidening, you'll grow several crops on the same field. Um, there is generally an advanced monetary system. This is, we, we see money develop out of agricultural systems, uh, most interestingly out of the necessary debts that start to accrue in these systems. Um, and um, activities tend to be heavily regulated by religious and social festivals. So in other words, um, the coordination of social activity is on a much larger scale. Um, <clears throat> uh, the division of labor is also more highly specialized, including uh, the development of professions, castes, and class. Um, that is, in other words, you don't spend your time doing everything you need to survive. You spend your time doing one thing in that society and you earn money for it, and then in exchange for that money, you can get the things you need. Good example of this is in Bali, in the tiered gardens here. This is an example of them that you see, they're growing rice. Um, the Bali is an island, fresh water is a scarce resource, and the main source of it is in an extinct uh, volcano at the top of the largest mountain in the center of the island this big volcanic lake, uh, there are these water temples 
uh, th where at various times during the year there are different festivals, and those festivals are timed to open up the gates of the water distribution system so that different fields get watered at different times, and the water from the fields above flows down into the fields below. That water is also very high in nitrogen because these fields also attract lots of ducks and other waterfowl, um, as well as containing fish and that sort of thing. So, so it's a very efficient system, but it's all very highly regulated by religious festivals. Finally, industrial agriculture, also known as agribusiness. This is sort of farming in the sort of European tradition starting with industrialization, okay? It's mechanized. So we have moved from um, human or animal labor into uh, replacing that with mechanical labor, right? The cotton gin is sort of the beginning of this. <clears throat> uh, it involves very large scale land use. It tends to involve monoculture. So you'll have vast areas of the country that are growing just one thing. A bit, great example of this right now across the Midwest is corn, uh, because corn is actually, uh, it's a key ingredient, obviously. It's a key grain. Uh, so it's involved in feeding livestock. It's involved in just eating corn, but that's actually the smallest part of it. Most corn is grown to be turned in, well, it's the key ingredient of, big surprise, high fructose corn syrup. Um, and that is a key ingredient in so many foods nowadays. Uh, so growing corn is extremely lucrative um, uh, as a result. Now, because there is so much of this stuff being grown, the crops in these economies actually become commodity, commodities. They are something that can be traded on financial markets and speculated on. Um, that is a key feature of this kind of economy. Uh, another key feature is that it is highly technological. This combine that you see in front of you uh, is actually connected to GPS and can actually be guided down almost to the furrow um, to keep a straight line down the field. They're extremely efficient and it involves a lot of very high technology. Now, finally, I want to reinforce something that I mentioned earlier, which is that these categories are not monolithic. Everybody mixes strategies to some extent. They may have one dominant strategy, but uh, they will incorporate other ones as well. So for instance, foragers often supplement their foraging with occasional horticulture. Pastoralists will sometimes have seasonal gardens. Intensive agriculture and slash and burn societies might also keep small herds or flocks. Uh, and of course, our own, in our own society, how do you think we supplement or augment agribusiness? Well, there's one example right in front of you here, which is the backyard garden. If you know anybody who gardens, uh, you know that they oftentimes end up with more, uh, more produce than they can consume themselves. And that what happens to that extra produce is interesting because it moves into an economy that's a lot more like hunter-gatherers, foragers, than it is like capitalism. Uh, you give this stuff away without an expectation that, other, that people will return it necessarily. And yet, your neighbors will probably do the same thing for you. Uh, it's a system called generalized reciprocity that we'll talk about more in a few weeks when we talk about economics. <clears throat> But think about what are some other ways that our own society mixes subsistence strategies. All right, uh, with that said, have a great week. Good luck on the test, stay safe, bye.